It's always a thrill to be here at Dazer. Uh, we have been working at the National Endowment for um, four and a half years or so on uh, really looking at the intersections of arts and science, and I've been fortunate to, to be kind of uh, central to some of that work at the NEA. It's been really amazing to see in some ways how this conversation that's been happening at Dazer for a number of years now, how many years? Oh, fifth year. Um, it seems like uh, there was, in some ways, um, some early adopters in, in, in sensing that there's some real energy and opportunity at the intersections of, of art and science. Um, it now feels like, in some ways, that this is being picked up almost everywhere. Um, how many people are, are here for the first time? Wow, it's quite a few. Um, well, you're in for a treat. For, uh, you're in for a treat tonight. Um, I have. Uh, it was a little bit touch and go on whether I was even going to be here tonight. I uh, encountered a little bit of art and and and, and medicine uh, about a week ago. Had a major foot re reconstruction surgery, and um, it was last Tuesday. And as I was going out, I was sort of surprised and delighted that they had a really good speaker system in the uh, surgery room. And somehow, not because they had asked me, but they had uh, my favorite band Wilco's song, Wilco Loves You, playing as I was you know, counting down from 10. <clears throat> so as I was about to go under the knife, I was nodding my head, hearing my favorite band say they love me, um, <laughs> dreaming about uh, taking a hike on the Pacific Crest Trail, which I haven't been able to dream about in years. And I really do think, I feel, and I can't prove that that had a lot to do with, with um, uh, already, you know, me feeling good and, and um, uh, sort of attacking uh, my way through my recovery. Um, but what I really want to talk about now is how we are in a really interesting place where there seems to be such terrific amount of interest in very high levels uh, in what these intersections can, um, you know, the promise that, that holds, f f you know, that, that exists in these intersections. Um, I'll just list two examples very quickly. Um, what used to be called the center of the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine uh, over at NIH recently changed their name to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Um, the switch of those last two words is, is really huge, I think. Instead of alternative medicine, this is now integrative health. Um, there's also um, there's a Keck Futures convening that's, that the National Academies is helping to sponsor that's happening in November, focusing on art, science, engineering, and medicine, and they're bringing in some really top-level people to think about how we can try to harness uh, some of the assets that exist in these different sectors to accomplish common goals. And I think that's what's really most exciting about uh, the potential of, of where we are now and what's, what's possible soon. Um, you're going to hear from four of my favorite people uh, who are have been working to help us understand and illuminate exactly what happens when things go well at these intersections of art and medicine. Um, the first one is, is going to be Melissa Walker, who I've been working with for um, about four years, four and a half years. Uh, um, she'll, she'll describe more about uh, work that they're doing at the Walter Reed and the National Intech, uh, in the National Intrepid Center of Excellence on helping to confront the invisible wounds of these wars. Um, they have an amazing patient-centered care model there. Uh, in terms of um, complementary alternative, or I'm sorry, complementary integrative care, they're doing it there as well as anywhere that I know. Um, I'm really looking forward for you to hear a little bit more about that. Um, Melissa knows that um, I'm uh, in a I'm habitual in quoting one of my favorite people of, of all time and, and throughout humanity is Aristotle. Um, Aristotle was a man of medicine first. Uh, he then went on to become maybe one of the world's greatest theater critics of all time. And he thought of catharsis, I don't think, as something that belonged to art or medicine. He thought it was something that belonged to human beings who needed to use it in order to, as he said, bring intellectual clarity from, from emotional chaos. When you think about it, almost any arts-making activity somehow employs that ethic at its core. Um, music, a song, is basically harnessing noise and, and turning it into melody and meter. Um, a painting is not just a picture of, of something. It's, it's uh, an interpretation of what that something is and what it means to the painter and then shared with the beholder. 
even in, in most ex abstract terms in some cases. Um, not quite so long ago, William Osler is another, uh, I think, giant in this field where uh, he founded the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine uh, in the 1890s. He's often referred to as the father, father of modern medicine. And he has another one of my favorite quotes, which is, listen to the patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. And that really becomes the ethic, I think, of patient-centered care. Um, it also, I think, applies to everything that, that works when art, when art and medicine are working well together. Um, and Kristen Beck, I can't wait for you to meet Kristen, um, is, uh, I think, in some ways going to help um, illuminate that idea. Um, because when art is infused with medicine, it can allow a patient to listen more intently to themselves and to get a clearer and, and better understanding and a deeper sense of self. Um, this can be something that's very useful in communicating more effectively with your caregivers, but it also can be something that can be very useful for you to take a, a, as tools that you're using on your own journey. Um, and J.D. and I talked a little bit about bringing in a, a perspective that's not technically medicine, but that might be able to shed some uh, further illumination into what it is that we're here to discuss tonight. Um, Mariel Hardiman is somebody I've been a huge fan of. She's a neuro education scientist, would that be? Yes, researcher. She's doing some of the best research on what the neurological underpinnings are uh, in a learning moment. Um, and I think a learning moment really has everything to do, I mean, go back to the, to the Aristotle quote, bringing intellectual clarity from emotional chaos is a learning moment. It may have a, a, a wellness and a healing aspect to it. And if it does, there's something to be learned from Mariel and her work. And Lisa Wong is going to be, um, uh, sort of batting cleanup tonight. And Lisa is probably the best example that we could think of who uh, embraces high level of skills across art and medicine. Um, she's an accomplished musician, she's a pediatrician, um, and she's going to talk a little bit about how uh, art can and music can um, play a part both in medicine but also about what the impact it has on uh, musicians who play music. Um, the last thing I want to do is just quickly plug because I think you guys would be interested. Um, Marielle actually was a part of this. We recently had a report, How Creativity Works in the Brain, that was released uh, from the National Endowment for the Arts and um, the Santa Fe Institute, which is a, uh, a complex systems um, scientific think tank, I guess you could say. Uh, we brought together people like Marielle as well as some really high profile artists and neuroscientists and psychologists to look at um, how does creativity work in the brain? What is the nature of creativity in the brain? And there's one quote that I worked at a long time. Uh, so rather than just try to remember, I'm going to go ahead and read. Um, the arts and science and technology, technological progress, economic, <laughs> maybe I should have just tried to do it off the cuff. The arts and sciences, technological process, economic prosperity, nearly every significant advance achieved by entire societies are driven by human creativity. Yet somehow our understanding of how creativity should be defined, nurtured, and optimized remains surprisingly elusive. But perhaps the fastest and most effective way for us to claw our way out and to, and to achieve our goals will be an, via an all-hands-on-deck approach that synthesizes and activates insights across, across art, science, and humanities in efforts to solve these riddles. Um, I am thrilled that you're going to be able to hear from four people who are harnessing assets and um, capabilities from across these sectors. And uh, we'll turn it over to just Melissa or 